Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at Gator Dave underscore SEC. Coming at you after the Gators first scrimmage. And the first time in a while, me and Will Miles back together right here, breaking down spring practice coverage right here on Gators Breakdown. Will, it's been a while. Um, I know you've been following along with what's been happening in the last few weeks with Gator spring practice. And, you know, it means something for everybody different. It does something different for everybody out there. How serious should you take it? How serious should you not take it? Limited limited exposure. You don't get a whole lot of you know, seeing it with your own eyes because Billy Napier, the way he closes it down. But uh, still, you know, a little bit seeps out or whatever. And if you want to trust it, you know, you can or you can't. But uh, we'll get into the little we'll get into the edge group tonight and a little bit of Q and A. Uh, it's the first time you and I are back together for 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 a little while. Yeah, so Dave Soderquist posted a uh, a clip the other day of Steve Spurrier when he was at South Carolina during spring practice, coming up and just ripping his team. And he's like, "You ever hear a coach say that in the spring? Nobody ever says that." <laughs> and I do think that we need to take it with a grain of salt, right? That if everybody is is praising the offensive line, that could mean the offensive line is great. That could mean the defense is really, really bad. And you just need to keep all that stuff in mind when you're when you're going over it. But look, I mean, spring, you got all the all the flowers coming. Up well, at least where I'm at, you got all the flowers coming up, starting to get warm. Uh, hope springs eternal, and and spring football is one of those times where you look at it. And I think most of us have realistic expectations for the 2024 Florida season, but when that kickoff comes against Miami, we're all going to be sitting there hoping that it, that an 11 and two or a 12 and one season's on the horizon. And this is where that all starts, right? I mean, we're going to look back if a season like that were to happen and go, remember, we, we heard the seeds of that <laughs> during spring practice. Obviously, if it goes the other way, we'll be like, those people never tell the truth. And, and it sort of goes that way. But um, I mean, it's, Fun stuff to talk about. There's all these new guys in camp. Certainly, we know that there is a lot of learning and a lot of coaching going on. Um, The question becomes, how does that fit together? And we aren't going to know that till fall. I think what we might know is especially because everybody expects the spring transfer portal to be a pretty active transfer portal for college football in general, depending upon how active Florida is in terms of guys leaving and guys coming, I think it'll tell us a lot about maybe what was true and what wasn't in a way that we couldn't figure out in the past because there just wasn't that mechanism, you know, five, six, seven years ago, you know, back in 2017, when Jim McElwain was talking about how great the offensive line was during spring practice, there wasn't any ability to correct it, even if it was bad. And, uh, you know, so you talk up your players and, and or even, figure out where to go or from his, there. Or even his first spring practice when Florida had, what, like six spring, uh, six offensive linemen for his first spring practice, I believe. Yeah, uh, but he didn't say they were good that year. It no, was 2017 right, right. where he was talking them up, yeah. getting ready for Michigan. And then we learned very quickly that uh, whatever had been observed of the offensive line playing well was because they'd been playing the second team defense. So, uh, <laughs> you know, look, I, I think – we should get excited when we see this stuff. It's exciting because we only get a few of these every year. There are things we can analyze and say, hey, we think this is real. There are things we can analyze and say, we don't really know. Um, but certainly the news coming out of camp, especially with the open practices, sort of then feeds into hopefully what you see in the spring game. And I don't know that you're necessarily looking for like a standout in the spring game. And I think we'll get into this, but you're looking for specific things that maybe indicate that what we were hearing and what was observed by, in some of the open sessions was true. So that's that's sort of, you know, you're never going to get the complete picture at this point, but can we start yeah. piecing? it together I, I think we can based on what we hear and uh and and what's said yeah i tend to err on the side of optimism during spring because i mean that's just it's what it is you know as you said we won't know till the fall but I, I i tend to look at it as if this team's going to be good why can they be good and i think you know we can take a look at the you know the positions groups you know, why can this position group be good why can this position group be better in the 2024 season than they were last you know last year that's the ten, that's the way i tend to look at at, at spring of maybe why the team can be better doesn't mean they will doesn't mean this that position group will turn out that way but if they are going to be good it's probably because of the way we, you know we've we've chosen to look at it uh, and, and getting ready for uh, fall camp there. So, yeah, we'll look at the edge group tonight, and we'll get into some uh, Q&A as well. Gators Breakdown Plus members sent some questions in uh, over the last couple of weeks, so we'll get into a few of those right here on this episode of Gators Breakdown. So hit that like button, subscribe to Gators Breakdown if you haven't done so yet. 
You'll get those notifications when there's a new Gators breakdown, when we go live, all that good stuff. Leave a comment as well. All your support doing those things really helps Gators Breakdown grow. And, of course, Gators Breakdown Plus chat is still going on. Discord chat right there. Extra episodes, ad-free episodes of Gators Breakdown. All that good stuff. So you can send me questions there as a member as well. Use them on these episodes like that. Link is in the description to join Gators Breakdown Plus. So, all right, well, let's get into it right here. It uh, it was a little. I knew it when we were going through all the coaching changes of this off season, but we all started looking at it. Patrick Tony gone, Corey Raymond gone, Sean Spencer gone, Jay Bateman gone. Mike Peterson's the only original defensive hire Billy Napier made that is still on the staff. <laughs> so I don't know if a lot of people realize that or not, but it was like, oh yeah, that that that, that was in the back of my head, but I kind of forgot about it until I was putting this episode together, and look. Of course, we certainly need to see the improvement in his group of edge players here. Florida only had 22 sacks last season. Lose sack leader, Princely Human Mielin. Justice Boone returns from injury. So does Tyreek Zapp, uh, the player that you know did go on to replace Boone, uh, along with the emerging TJ Searcy. So let's hear from Mike Peterson on the edge group. Searcy, what do you see in him? Um, a guy that can do it all. You know, he can play the run. Uh, he, can, he can rush the pass or he can drop into coverage. Um, complete player um, and, and a, a great kid also. That's that's probably the biggest thing that he has going for him, great kid. Where does Boone fit in, you think, or can, can he play some edge or is he more in the and other Boone can, Boone can do it all. So if I say TJ is the athletic guy, Boone is, the, um, Boone is the leader of the group. He's the guy that's been around. Um, I didn't recruit him, but I, I didn't recruit him here, but I recruited him when I was at the other place. So me and him had a relationship before I got here, um, which is a, is, is a huge thing, you know. I can, I can coach him hard. Um, Boone is the guy when the group is uh, looking a little slow, a little sluggish. I just get on Boone, and, and Boone kind of gets the group right. So he's definitely the leader of the group, and, and you know what he can do on the field. Right now, um, he's probably going through probably the hardest thing in, in football. And I tell all the guys, you know, injury. Uh, it's a process coming back. You know, you, know, you want to be ready tomorrow, but it doesn't work that way. You know, you got to itch and do what you're supposed to do in the, in the training room and, and get yourself back. What stood out to you about LJ McRae throughout the recruitment process and, and his early time here so far? Same guy I recruited. That's the same guy I'm getting on the field. Um, he's, he's a worker, I tell you that. You know, the guy, he's, he's meeting a lot. Um, you know, early in the process, it was every night. We was up here <laughs> and we was getting at it. You know, and I, as a coach, that's, you know, that, that's exciting. When you got a young guy to come in and, and, and wants to be great. You know what I mean? A lot of times you usually have to, you know, de-recruit them guys, you know, break them and let them know the recruitment process is over. But uh, you, you could tell, you know, his upbringing, mom and dad, you know, and doing the process, they did a really, really good job with him. George mm -hmm. Gums, what kind of prospect is he? Gums. Gums is like, uh, Gums is, I'm a car guy, I'm an old car guy, man. Gums is like that new car I got in the garage and I'm just kind of fixing up and nobody knows about it. <laughs> there you go. What, what type of model are we talking about? Oh, so Gums, man, he can run, man. He's stronger than you. He's stronger than I thought coming in. He can run. He's very, very athletic. Um, and he's, um, he's, he's, a, he's a guy that's, that's soaking up all of everything I give him. Yeah. You know, I, I can tell him to, you know, jump and touch this ceiling and he's going to try to do it. So he's, he's, he's soaking in everything that I'm telling him. You know, he, he's another um, meeting room rat. Uh, love to get in the meeting room and, and watch tape and study the game. So I'm excited about, you know, what I'm seeing from um, Gums. Mike, do you find a lot of guys with chips on their shoulders? They've had two losing seasons. I got a chip on my shoulder. You can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You always had yeah, one. Yeah, well, I always had one. But, yeah, you, you know, you can see it in practice, man. You know, we, we getting after it. You know, the offense, you know, we getting after it. You go, you watch our inside run, you watch team run, man, you'll think it's game day. But the thing about it, and it, it gets chippy. And then after the practice, you know, you see the guys, they hugging each other and, and laughing and having a good time. That's when you know you, you, you're building a team. And, and building a team, man, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of things that go into it. You know, it's a process. You know, it's like building a house. You don't, you don't just say, hey, uh, uh, we got a house here. You got to build it. Sometimes they take a little time, you know what I mean? And, and building a team is, is the same way. But when you start building that team, it starts to look good. But I like that same house. When the house starts to go up, you ride by, you start to smile. I'm, I'm smiling now. There we go. 
edge coach Mike Peterson. We'll hear from Justice Boone, Tyreek Sapp in just a bit too. But, well, man, if we look up front and we kind of just build a depth chart a bit, it probably looks something like this. We'll go defensive line first before we go to the, the edge group. We'll talk about the edge, but still, I think we got to look up front as a whole. You know, Cam Jackson, nose tackle, Joey Slatman, defensive tackle. And then, you know, Justice Boone and or Tyreek Sapp at that edge F spot and then TJ Searcy at the edge Jack spot. Uh, but, you know, maybe behind Jackson, you got nose at the nose, Jamari Lyons, Dez Watson behind Slackman at defensive tackle. That I, I assume, you know, Caleb Banks, Kelby Collins. Uh, and then, you know, that edge F spot we'll, we'll get into here behind Boone and Sapp, you look like you, you look at players, Cam James, LJ McCray, uh, Brian Taylor, the, the transfer that Florida brought in, then at the Jack spot, Jack Pyburn coming back from injury. George Gums, who you just heard Mike Peterson talk a whole lot about, uh, and probably the positional flex of LJ McCray again, uh, Jamarcus Weston in, in that group now too. So, and maybe even Kelby Collins fitting into that group still too some. Uh, he'll mostly stick in that defensive line group and not edge. So, well, I think when you look at it, the edge room just doesn't have a lot of experience at that at that jack spot, the pass rusher spot. So it definitely more of a wait and see there. TJ seriously leading the way. I think there's a lot to like with this edge group as a whole, with the return of Justice Boone and Tyreek Sapp at that F spot, as long as Boone recovers well uh, to give Florida a good two-man rotation at the F. But you know, that strong side defensive end spot, maybe even more with LJ McCray waiting in the wings too. But just go to that jack spot, and there's just – you know, there's not there's not a slam dunk there. Um, that's just the reality. Uh, I think there's a lot to prove there. Of course, I like TJ Searcy there. He did not miss a tackle a season ago. Graded as Florida's best tackler, according to Pro Football Focus. But he's going to need help. I mean, I, I do like him. I like what he brings to the table. Hopefully, he takes that one year to year two jump. But you've got something there that what we've seen from Justice Boone and Tyreek Sapp the last couple of years. Those guys, hopefully. Boone was a guy that was just standing out last year until he got hurt. It was a name I was he hearing in spring camp, fall camp, until he got hurt. Uh, but, you know, TJ Sears, you, you, know, you hope it's just something he can build on uh, because Florida's missing a lot, you know, would, you know in some ways. <laughs> I know there's a, a polarizing Prince Lee Human Mielin out there, you know, talking that Ole Miss right now. But, uh, you know, he was still Florida's best pass rusher last year. Florida's going to have to replace at least that at bare minimum. Yeah, I think – what you're going to find is that you've got, you know, you talk about sort of replacement by committee. And I think that's in many ways what they're going to be doing here. Pyburn coming back from an injury, Boone coming back from the injury. Those two guys are probably really the keys when you think about it, just because they're going to be the depth at those positions, even if they maybe don't come back at 100% right off to start the year. When you get to that five game stretch at the end of the year, where Florida's going to need to be hitting on all cylinders, those guys are going to have to be fully recovered because you figure you're going to deal with an injury or two during the course of the season. You know, George Gums is a guy three and a half sacks last year at, at Northern Illinois. Um, not necessarily six and a half tackles for loss. You look at his PFF grades; they're not like fantastic. So it's it's not. I'm not sitting here going, "Oh, that's a guy who's going to be able to replace Human Milan." one for one. I think you're going to have to find ways to do it across the board. I think part of that will be Boone coming back. Part of that will be Sap coming back. Part of that will be Searcy taking a step forward. And part of that's going to be LJ McCray and what yeah. he can provide as a five-star coming in right off the bat. The reality is, is that Florida lost a lot of those guys who flipped in order, you would assume, to keep DJ Lagway and to keep LJ McCray. And what that really means is those two guys are going to have to have an impact early on, maybe maybe McCray even quicker than Lagway because you've got Mertz at the quarterback position. And we're looking at the edge saying there's a hole here. There just is. There's nobody out there. There's no Alex Brown. There, there's, no, there's no Javon Curse, at least not right now. And if you're trying to sort of just plug those holes with some of these guys to get – Average play. I mean, look, I, I think the back end of the defense was more of a problem than up front last year when you really start delving into the numbers. Slackman maybe helps up front, and and if he can occupy double teams, well, now you maybe even have better – you end up with better play than you could have before just because you've got better interior play. But um, this is definitely a fill the gaps with a committee, and if you're going to be filling with a committee, then that means guys like Pyburn, guys like Boone – 
are going to have to be healthy when it really comes down to it, when you hit the teeth of the SEC schedule. Um, otherwise, they're going to struggle just because it'll be like last year with the linebackers where Shamar James goes down, Scooby Williams jumps in, you had Manny Nunnery a little bit, you had a few other guys there, but really there just wasn't anybody who could even approximate average at the linebacker position, and that's my worry. My worry is if a guy like Gums goes down or a guy like Searcy goes down, well, what does that mean? Does that mean you got LJ McCray out there playing, you know, hand in the dirt three plays, three plays every every drive? I mean, what do you end up having to do? How do you have to manipulate these guys? And do you end up with guys playing out of position? You know, you, the the F position you talked about, Boone and Sap, that makes a lot of sense. But if you all of a sudden have to put one of those guys at edge because of injury or just because of lack of production, well, that's not really those guys' natural position. I think you start running into the issues there. So. Certainly a place that you would expect if they're going to do some shopping during the transfer portal, that edge would be a place where they thought about. Yeah. Um, it was a place they thought about last year, but didn't really make any additions either. I mean, Napier was pretty open and honest last year during spring talking about the fact that they needed more guys at that edge position. One of the reasons why Jamarcus Weston is there is because there's actually potentially playing time and snaps there. And there just weren't, there wasn't playing time and snaps at the other positions he's tried so far. Um, Great for Weston. I'm not sure that you want to be necessarily relying on a guy who was recruited at wide receiver, <laughs> moved to tight end and safety, and is now trying his uh, try, trying his. Uh, He's even been a kickoff returner. I mean, look, <laughs> that's awesome that the kid wants to play, wants to be a Gator, and wants to yeah. contribute. That's awesome. That's a problem when you're playing Georgia, right? <laughs> if that guy's getting major snaps against Georgia, that's probably a problem. So to me, the depth piece is the thing that makes me worry the most is one or two of these guys goes down. We saw it last year, right? I think Florida's defense at least um, has a competency that they didn't have last year if Justice Boone is out there. The minute he went down, well, now your front four is compromised. And considering some of the problems they had on the back end, well, that got compromised as well pretty quickly and and things just fell apart. Yeah, well, if we go Princely and Miel one more time, you know, he was the only proven pass rusher last season, um, and even that was inconsistent, of course. And Florida needs more from, as you said, that group. I, I agree with you. I think it's going to be a group. I don't know if there's going to be this outstanding standout one guy that goes gets 12, 13 sacks. I don't know if that happens, uh, but maybe they can be a group. But hey, look, as you go into your point, the depth and look, maybe it does come from an unknown like George Gums. You brought him up, and Mike Peterson just mentioned him. You heard Peterson praise and just went on about Gums and you know, went on to say that you know, go Gums is so raw, he's so coachable, um, that he's able to mold him, doesn't have to break any bad habits. And we'll if we go to that, Gums played in 12 games last season, as you mentioned, uh, started the last seven consecutive at defensive end, uh, finished with 32 total tackles. Six and a half for loss, three and a half sacks, three quarterback hurries, two forced fumbles. Uh, so they, they like the untapped potential there. He only plays defense one year. Uh, last year was his first year playing defense. So that's the raw untapped potential of the George Gums there uh, that that the staff likes. And you know how fast can he transition to the SEC with so little experience playing defense? Uh, look, he may not be you know, <laughs> or he may be one of the names discussed. You know, not. It, it, you, you hear him, they're bringing him up right now. That's what spring is for. Um, we'll see how big of a contributor he is uh, when, when it's all said and done. So, uh, well, uh, one topic, um, Mike Peterson was asked about sacks, um, and he went on to say, quote, look, sacks is a combination of the whole defense. You know, not just the front guys, not just the secondary, not just the linebackers. I don't think the defense has been, as a whole, has been where it needs to be. So when the defense as a whole is not playing where they need to be, sometimes certain categories may be a little lower than you want them to be. We're working on it as a whole. And I think that's what we're trying to improve, not just be good up front, not just be good in the secondary, but we want to be a complete defense. That's when you have success all over the board. So as I mentioned, Will, the sack number is not that high. Only had one player that was a somewhat consistent pass rusher, but Princely not a consistent overall player. Uh, there goes on to Ole Miss. Um, yeah, but the sack numbers, as we've mentioned, you know, Florida, not great in the secondary. Uh, of course, you know, you can't ask those guys to cover forever, but you know, the, the pressure up front, the physicality up front uh, need, needs to be there. You know, so Mike Peterson, I think he, he's got his hands full, you know, for, for a group that was with Justice Boone going down last year was kind of overall disappointing. Yeah, definitely got a work cut out for him to get those sack numbers up. Well, the good news is, is on the back end, he's going to get some help. 
with some of the transfers that they brought in. Um, certainly you talk about Pup Howard at linebacker, and then you talk about Asa Turner and, and DJ Douglas at safety, along with hopefully a step up from Jordan Castell. And then you have Triquez Bridges there at corner. You combine all of that, and the defensive back room should be better, which means there aren't any excuses. Now, if you look at the defensive havoc numbers, so Florida was at 16% last year overall. So those are plays that um, that end in a tackle for loss, PBU, interception, uh, pass deflection. Um, those sorts of things. And the havoc rate was 16% for the defense, which is sort of middle of the road. It's not great, but it's not terrible. Some of those, some of those really good Grantham defenses there, I guess 2019 would have been a really good Grantham defense. They were up around 19 or 20% havoc rate. The defenses at Southern Miss that that Austin Armstrong had that were good had havoc rates up in that 19 to 20% range. The front seven was at 10.3%. The DBs were at 5.7. Again, both of those are middle of the road. Neither one of those is like oh my God, that's just terrible. And, you know, compared to all the other teams in the country, those are awful. Um, what you see where they're awful is, especially in the passing game, giving up explosive plays. That's where they were bad. Um, and, and so is that because they're not getting home? Is it because the defensive backs can't cover? Is it a combination of both? I think you talk to any coach, they'll tell you it's a combination of both. But that excuse won't be here that much anymore now that you got the guys on the back end. Because look, Florida, if you look at their overall rankings, when you look at individual player rankings, um, whether it's EPA per play, whether it's pro football focus ratings, whatever it is, the corners and the safeties have been bad now for three or four years running. And, you know, we can talk about defensive line all we want, and certainly they can help the defensive backs not be as bad. But, you know, we're going into a, the first season in a while where Florida should have experienced guys who've put good quality football on film at the safety position. And, and that's going to mean a lot, probably more than how effective the committee is up front. Just because at the end of the day, if you can make the quarterback double clutch, it allows guys to get home mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, vice versa, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> but there was no double clutches going on next year or last year and nobody was getting home. So uh, it, was, it was a rough one for that defense the whole way down the board. Absolutely. So, all right, let's, so let's hear from a couple of the guys that will be responsible for trying to rise those sack numbers for the defense, Justice Boone and Tyreek Sapp. Remember, it was Sapp that had to kind of take over at that F strong side defensive end spot once Justice Boone went down last season. Sapp had to slide over. And look, now it gives Florida some depth at that spot. Now that Sapp's been able to play there, they get Boone back uh, as long as Boone bounces back. Uh, so potential for a pretty good pairing here. Two guys that have great leadership qualities need to be ready for that role. Let's first hear from Justice Boone and start with him dealing with that injury that kept him out of last season, and then he'll dive into a bit more. Very tough, uh, expecting, especially coming from the perspective that I was uh, viewing myself from last year as being a teeter, team leader and uh, being a big uh, impact for my defense. Uh, it's definitely humbling. Um, just as fast as you could be granted with a lot of great things and great opportunities that could be taken away from you. But uh, honestly, um, I learned a whole lot about myself and I uh, uh, leaned on my spiritualness and uh, my relationship with God and uh, it got me through it and I found peace with him and uh, with myself. What did you learn besides besides you know, that connection? What, what beyond that did you learn? Uh, honestly, I just learned that I'm a lot more tougher than, uh, than I thought I was. Um, I wouldn't say that I don't think that I'm a tough guy. I just uh, seen myself push through some things that have uh, been really challenging and uh, that I just honestly didn't see myself pushing out through, but I was um, consistent and I was faithful and I believed that I could do it and I'm doing good. How's it been being back on the field this uh, spring? It feels great. I mean, honestly, I'm real. I'm slowly progressing. Uh, I'm not fully uh, back. I'm no contact right now, but I'm doing individual and I'm moving around and stuff good, but it's an uh, amazing feeling. I mean, like I, like, I can say that uh, just thinking back a few months ago, man, I couldn't even walk. So it's like, it's a blessing. So, yeah. Do you feel like you're on track for the season or fall camp? Or do you know yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm definitely right on track. Uh, like I said, I'm not in contact right now. The numbers and stuff is uh, not quite there, but sure. definitely progressing. Um, I'm a little bit ahead of progress, but we're just still being precautious, not rushing anything so I can make sure I'm prepared for when the season's comes. What's been the hardest part of this process of being limited in practice and one to go maybe more than you can. <laughs> that part. <laughs> Definitely just being limited. Um, like I said, man, I've just been sitting down for a long time. So just like getting my feet back wet and just like I just want to do more and more and more and more. But I just know I got to be patient and uh, like I said, have belief and uh, faith in my team and my trainers and in God that uh, it's going to all come in the right time. You were emerging as a 
Go ahead. You, were, you were emerging as a leader last year. How much more confident do you feel in, in the vocal role and, and helping out some of these young guys on campus? Uh, I feel very good. Um, honestly, I can say that my injury uh, gave me a different perspective uh, as far as it coming from a leader, being a teammate. And um, I just uh, honestly can see things from a different point of view. I was able to see things from a different point of view. So I honestly think that I'm better for them. I'm, I'm more equipped for them. Um, although I may not be 100% back physically, I'm 100% mentally. And I've gotten stronger over the past few months, and I'm continuing to get stronger. I don't know if you pay attention to any preseason expectations, but it seems like a lot of people are sleeping on, on this team for sure. But how confident are you that the defense is going to improve and you guys are going to exceed some of those outside expectations? Um, honestly, man, like I'm uh, pretty sure you heard it from uh, comments of us a lot of time. But uh, anybody that's not in this building, man, we we can't listen to it. It's, it's just not important to us. Uh, we know what we're doing here. Uh, we know how hard we work. We know how um, intentional we are with our work, and we've uh, went over the film and we've went over our mistakes multiple times, and we're getting better. Um, I believe in this team. We all believe in this team. We, we're gonna be good. All right, well, so, you know, Boom was one of those players, as I'll go back to it, was hearing about the most last spring, early days of fall camp that was ready to break through, and we didn't get to see it. Staff was very, very high on what he was doing and just kind of messed up the rotation once he went down. Uh, then Sap had to slide over, maybe even put him out of position for a season. Uh, but look, all that happened a couple weeks before the first game. So Florida kind of scrambling just two weeks before the first game uh, when, when Justice Boone went down. So, of course, all that can pay off this season. Uh, Boone has been observed wearing a knee brace, but fully participating in drills during the skill development period uh, by the media there. So, but just not any contact uh, so far. But Napier, he's praised Justice Boone a lot. He's quote, you know, one Justice Boone, one of my favorite players I've ever coached. Made a ton of progress on the field as a player, but more importantly, as more importantly as a person, he's probably one of the realest young men that we have. He's transparent. He holds people accountable, and he speaks the truth. And I think his growth as a person and as a leader has affected our team, Napier said back on March 7th. Um, even though he didn't play last year, I think he's been impactful. So I'm hopeful you know his return to play will continue to be a process and he'll have a chance to affect our team, not only off the field, but on the field as well. Uh, so without Napier, Boone admits that he may not be in his current position as a locker room leader, Will. Uh, that realization came after reflecting on his early career at Florida. He said, Coach Napier... Since he, um, since he got here, my second year, he's been, like, mentoring me. Like, we first got here, I wasn't always with the best crowd. I was still a little young, not necessarily doing everything I had to do. And he just kind of stepped on me a little bit and told me, hey, come on. I see a lot of you, and you could do better. So I appreciate him for it. I believed in him. I started believing in myself, and I made the changes that I needed to make. So, Look, well, that's what happens in college, right? We we all got to grow up at some point, and so we were a football team. Of course, there's a realization you probably got to grow up a, a bit more than than the normal college student. So Justice Boone going through that a little bit there. But uh, look, I got to spend a day with him uh, last summer uh, too. I, I was so impressed with him and and like his growth. Uh, talking about that uh, and, and being around him for a day last year, I was ready to watch him and see him break out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a. You, you, you do hope mentally that that's probably the biggest part here with Justice Boone. If he was ready to break out, if he was going to be that breakout player last year, well, maybe we do get to see it this year, but he's probably going to have to get over that mental hurdle of coming back from that injury. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of that at the same time when you've been gone for so long and you appreciate it the way he clearly does. I think in some ways that maybe makes you hungrier for it too. The, the thing we got to realize is that ACLs are, even though we now – expect everybody to come back immediately from those sorts of things. You know, it's, Hey, they're out. They'll be back next year. That's great. It still takes a little while for folks to get back into it. So early in the year, I wouldn't necessarily expect them to be like running around the end and, and taking the quarterback's head off. I think maybe that comes as the season develops. Now, again, that might be critical because by the time we get towards those, la that last half of the season, Florida's going to need a guy like justice Boone coming off the edge and providing a lot of pressure. Now, the thing is, if you look at 2022, he was a very effective player. 282 snaps. He had, he had a 73.2 overall defensive rating for Pro Football Focus. Pass rush 67.3. Run defense 71.6. So he was consistent. And I think that's one of the things that you notice. If you even if you look at a guy like Human Milan last year, 
good against the good in pass rush, bad against the run, bad in coverage. That's not what you saw in 2022 from Justice Boone. And so just that consistency, if that can come in into play, I think will be a big deal. And then you start looking at Florida sack numbers from last year. You got Human Millen at seven, Wingo at two and a half, Jaden Hill at two, Tyreek Sapp at two, Kelby Collins at one and a half. Nobody else had more than one sack for the game for the Gators last year. It's ridiculous, man. So I mean, even if it like, even if quote unquote. If Justice Boone can put up four or five sacks, like you wouldn't go, oh yeah, that guy's an all-American. But that is such an upgrade in terms of being able to get to the quarterback, being able to affect what he's doing. And and it's that thing, right? I mean, if you look at LSU last year, they got Jaden Daniels throwing the ball all over the place, can't stop anybody, and they go 10 and three. Probably could have won the national championship if they had a semi-competent defense. Florida had the same thing happen to them in 2020. Last year, Florida had the 2020 defense. They just didn't have anybody, they didn't have anything approximating. Kyle Trask or Jaden Daniels on offense. I don't think Florida's defense is going to be like a top 10 or top 20 unit, but they don't need massive improvements in one area to see a significant improvement overall to be, say, like a top 30, top 40, top 50 defense. What they need is they need solid play at every position across the board. They can't have weak links at five different places. And when you start looking at whether it's EPA per play, pro football focus, or just looking at the film, there were weak spots all over the place on defense. One of those weak spots was not having a guy like Justice Boone there uh, at, at at defensive end. And so bringing him in, allowing them to even just rest him and Tyreek Sapp will allow both of those guys to be more effective. Sapp obviously gets last year a ton of experience. And so you hope he can take a step forward. You hope a guy like Kelby Collins can take a step forward. You hope a guy like TJ Searcy can take a step forward. Um, but, you know, this is one of the problems with the Florida team this year, at least, is that we're looking at this defensive line going, we need three guys to take a step forward mm -hmm. for them really to be like a difference-making unit. Otherwise, it's just, can we put enough Band-Aids on this to where it doesn't, doesn't spell a disaster every time the Kentucky running back gets the ball? And, you know, that, that'll that determine a lot in terms of how successful the defense is, is how many of these guys who are coming in can take a step forward. We talk about that with Graham Mertz all the time. Can You know, he took a step forward last year. Can he take another step this year? I think you're asking the same thing about these guys on defense and specifically defensive line is not just can Justice Boone come in and approximate his 2022 performance. It's is he going to be able to take that 2022 performance and take it to the next level where we thought he might be in 2023. That's a big ask for a guy coming off an ACL surgery. I think, honestly, if he came in and replicated his 2022 performance with just more snaps because he's getting more opportunities, yeah. I think we should all be really happy with that result. And what that means is you're getting above average play from your defensive end, but you're not getting a guy putting up 12, 13, 14 sacks. It's just the reality of the situation. All right, let's uh, hear from our last uh, part of this edge group, Tyreek Sapp. I'm loving the young guys. I'm loving the new addition of coaches. I just feel like everybody's kind of hungry and kind of and kind of is ready, to like you know, push forward and take the next step, take the next step from last year. And everybody's kind of and everybody's kind of trying to push that edge and kind of understand each other. We still building chemistry because we got a whole bunch of new pieces and new faces. So we still trying to build that chemistry during team ball. But I think that everybody's intent and in what we trying to do and trying to understand the scheme and. And, and put forth just their put their best foot forward. So, and I think it's going to be a process from now until the fall. But I think we got the we trending in the right direction right now. Just from everyone, just from everyone wanting to do the right thing and and trying to push forward in that effort. You kind of being a leader to try to help these young guys. Oh yeah, of course. Oh yeah, of course. And my leadership role is big, and I take that leadership role very seriously because I understand I am an example for the young guys, and they're going to look for me for example. So I have to I have to stay disciplined every day day all day just kind of what I'm doing because I know they watching me they watching my routine they watching my tendency so I'm trying to just set a great example for the young guys so that when it's their time and whenever when they're when they're in there when they have their moment that they make the most of it the experience is going to help us greatly just not only solely because we are the experienced guys but it helps us bleed into the into the younger group into the fresh faces that are may not that may not be that may not be accustomed to the situations that we've been been in. So it's great that we're able to talk talk them talk them through certain things, help them understand help them understand certain things uh, from a schematic standpoint, and also 
to and also give them confidence. Let them know that we're here for them. And it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay. As long as you're going 100%, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay for bad things to happen. It's all about how you, it's all about how you, it's all about how you respond to these things. So that's one of the great things about it. Two straight losing seasons. Does that put a chip on everybody's shoulder? The same. Almost. Okay, we got to change this. Most definitely, but it's no pressure. To, it never was pressure in the first place. Never any pressure, but it's most definitely a chip on our shoulder. We gonna come out hot. We gonna come out steaming. But the main thing is just keeping the main thing. The main thing. One day at a time. One practice at a time. And one game at a time. When that time comes. So I don't think we're gonna rush ahead. But we do have a chip on our shoulder, and we do understand the circumstances. But we're not gonna let that kind of get in our heads to what this year is going to be. So we're just going to keep on moving forward, putting our best foot forward every day. And then when that time comes, everybody will see the end result. You, you moved last year because of Justice's injury. Yeah. That was an, quite an adjustment. I don't know if it was well, – No. Nah, what no. are you going to – what do you – well, tell me. Well, what, how do you think you did? Do you – is it going to be better if you can just kind of stay one place or you want to move around? What, what do you think? Uh, I'm a very versatile person, so I'm I'm not going – I'm not going to worry about whether if I play here or play here because you line me up anywhere on the field, anywhere up front, I can play it. So, you know, what we got going on right now, obviously I'm still on the edge, but wherever we line up and however we do things, go about things, I think I'm ready to do anything. And I'm, they already know I'm a reliable guy. I'm ready. So I feel like I've done a, I feel like I've done an exceptional job this past season. So I'm just working on growing and proving myself, you know, just every day, just every day looking at things, just always, always critiquing myself because like I tell you guys all the time, the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. So. Well, if we go back to the spring game two years ago, what, Billy Napier's first spring game, I think Tyreek Sapp was the guy who we came away with most impressed in the spring game itself. Uh, and then, like I said, last year, basically two weeks before the first game versus Utah, Tyreek Sapp's having to go switch positions and, and play in front of a, a uh, in place of a injured Justice Boone. So now gets to come back, return, same spot there. So that's got to be beneficial for him. And look, I mean, but what Sap sounds like, you know, and he mentions here, there's definitely a level of maturity here regarding his role uh, on the team. He knows that he has to lead, and I think that's a plus for uh, the experience Florida has up front with Sap and Boone. Uh, those players were going to be counted on to be young contributors uh, without much experience ahead of them, without much leadership ahead of them. Now it's their time to kind of just turn it around and th- them lead, them be, them, them be. The, the experienced pieces these young guys can lean on, and that's got to be advantage uh, for for the young guys they have. To, te- to have teammates like Sapp and Boone. So you know, he's straight up with that process, and that's what this time of year is for, learning the new coaches, the players and the coaches learning, the players learning the coaches, having it all come together. There's a lot of new faces on this defense uh, and you know, uh, up front as well. Uh, at least Mike Peterson returns to this edge group, but you, you hope all that experience with Boone, with Sapp, does pay off and then kind of just bleeds over into the young players. Yeah, I think you're sort of hitting the nail on the head in terms of what you said there from the standpoint of Sap having to change positions because of an injury. You hope that Florida is getting to a place in the depth department at most of these positions where an injury means next guy up, not next yeah. guy over. Right. <laughs> and that's what they <laughs> that's had to great, do last great year. Great way to put it. Great way to put it. And so, you know, th- that is the harm of all the guys who've transferred out, how young they were last year, all that sort of stuff. And, and like I said, I still think that they're probably going to go searching for defensive line help after spring. Um, or at least you would think that that would be a place where they would look at, especially if they end up with a guy nicked up or something like that as, as they're coming out of spring practice. Um, as far as SAP is concerned, I mean, he he may not feel pressure right now, but after the <laughs> opener against Miami, if if things start going downhill, they'll start to feel a little bit of pressure, I suppose. But these guys all are saying the right thing in terms of, hey, yeah, we we can only control what we can control one play at a time, one game at a time, all that stuff. They have been asked by every single reporter for six months, why did the defense suck in different ways, right? Like it hasn't been quite as blunt as that, but that has been the prevailing 
question that they've all had to answer. Every single one of them should have a giant, huge, enormous chip sitting on their back because they were a part of that. Right. And, and so I look at it and say, you know, sap being in a position where he's comfortable, maybe last year's paying some dues, being able to cross train a little bit in case there is an injury, certainly Kelby Collins and TJ Searcy coming up into the rotation, being able to take a step forward, gives them the ability to maybe not do that again. But look, three out of the last four years, Florida's defense has just been awful. And so it used to be the standard at Florida was, hey, we're not a top 10 defense. What's going on? Now it's like, can we please maybe like top 50? Like, can we figure out a way to get into there? And, uh, you know, they should have a chip on their shoulder and the coaches should be letting them know it. You know, you think about like, <clears throat> think about after Florida beat Alabama in the 2008 SEC championship game and you got Saban running the Florida offense on the scout team all off season to prepare Greg McElroy and that Alabama team in 2009 for Florida, like that sort of motivational tactic, those sorts of things where, you know, you're just playing an embarrassing loss over and over and over again in the weight room, like the chip on your shoulder. I agree during game day, you want to go one play at a time, one drive at a time, one game at a time. But when it comes to the off season, when it's the dog days and you're weightlifting, man, like these guys should all be ultra, ultra motivated to do all the things they're being asked to do. And, and, and the we'll, fact we'll that even going to that point, even on a Florida point, when Georgia stormed the field in 2007 and, you know, got ran over by no Sean Marino, all that's playing in the off season, all off season, all off season, Florida's getting ready for the Georgia game. And we see it very first drive of Georgia, Brandon Spikes is slamming no Sean Marino. Yeah. To your point. Yeah. You get, you hope you get tired of those type of things and do something about it the next year. Yeah, you you got to be healthy enough and you got to be skilled enough to do it though, right? I mean, that's yep. that's the difference is, or at, at least that's looking back, that's the difference, right? As Brandon Spikes became the player we wanted him to be between that 2007 and 2008 season. Now, some of that was because of Georgia and some of that was because he just sort of grew into the leader that he was going to be and and all those different things. And part of it is that team was really awesome and wound up winning a national championship. But uh, but you don't have to be a national championship caliber team to have a chip on your shoulder and use it to motivate yourself throughout the year. So, you know, we could hear all, like we talked early, like when we started the episode, well, what's real when it comes to spring practice? What's real is that in every single clip you've shown, and I'm sure in the clips you haven't shown, every single defensive player has been asked, do you have a chip on your shoulder since we've been calling <laughs> you terrible all for an entire year? And that more than anything maybe is a comfort to me because I'm now looking at it going, these guys all are hearing it, right? No. Maybe they've even tried to tune it out, but they go into their own room to, to answer these questions. And you got Edgar sitting there going, do you have a chip on your shoulder? Do you have a chip on your shoulder to every single guy who comes through? And they all have sort of the stock answer, the Napier answer where they're like, no, no, one game at a time, one play at a time, all that sort of stuff. They all have one. And so the hope is that obviously each of these guys, we talked about needing two or three of them to step up. Hopefully that sort of stuff makes them step up because, look, there's not only playing time on the line. If if these guys can really step into a major role, like if Tyreek Sapp can put up seven, eight sacks this year, if he could be a really disruptive force, that dude's getting drafted in the NFL next year. So it's not just like these guys, oh, well, they should do it for Florida and all that sort of stuff. It's like, no, like these guys are highly skilled players who, if they show out this year, have an opportunity to make a boatload of money on the back end of it. And beyond just the personal pride and beyond the 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 chip that's being given to you by the media and all that sort of stuff is is the carrot at the end. And I'm curious to see how some of these guys are able to take advantage of that. All right, so that was a good look at the edge group from Mike Peterson, from Justice Boone, from Tyreek Sapp right here on Gators Breakdown. Really good stuff from those guys uh, getting us kind of caught up uh, with, with that position group. So uh, later on, we sh later on this week we'll be running back. And wide receiver. Uh, we'll get to hear from Billy Gonzalez and probably some receivers as well. Uh, running backs have already uh, kind of talked, so we'll get that on the next episode uh, of Gators Breakdown. But we got some Q&A to get into right here uh, from some Gators Breakdown Plus members we'll get into. But before we do, Orange and Blue game, April 13th, of course, brought to you by Florida Victorious. And part of that is an exclusive Florida Victorious member benefit. Florida Victorious will host an autograph signing for its members with uh, head coach Billy Napier and some of the Gator football players. Um, well, I, my bad. It's not exclusive anymore because non-members can also get access for thirty dollars through Florida Victorious. All you have to do is go to the game, you know, be and get right there on the field after the Orange and Blue game. Meet and greet your favorite players. Get their autograph. Um, now's a great time to sign up for Florida Victorious. 
That $25 a month level gets you access to their message board as well. That includes some insider spring practice notes. So no brainer to help support the players, get access to players. You can get benefits to use code GatorsBD when you sign up to get 20% off your first month of Florida Victorious. Link is in the description to join. All right, we'll have some fun with some questions here. We get sent by some Gators Breakdown Plus members. Uh, Justice, Justice, yeah, Justin, we were talking about Justice Boone, so I got kind of tongue-tied there. Justin Wood of Gators Breakdown Plus, he sent a few questions in. Um, and what are you most looking forward to for spring ball? And we'll let you go first on this one. Yeah, I think there's been a lot of talk about what Graham Mertz has to do this year. Um, one of the things, so in preparing for our Read and Reaction preseason magazine that I thought was really interesting is if you look at the ratings for Graham Mertz when he's got a clean pocket, they're actually worse than when he's under pressure. And when he was not blitzed, it's significantly worse than when he was blitzed. Now, we've talked a lot extensively about his average depth of target being relatively low, 6.7 overall for the year, but he had a much higher average depth of target and was much better when the pocket was clean in 2022 at Wisconsin. But in under pressure situations, he was really awful at Wisconsin. So it's like he was able to flip that probably by being a little bit more conservative. And the question I, I know Napier even talked about it this week is can they get him to start taking smart risks down the field? Can he start to do that? You can really see it when you start looking at him versus cover one and cover three. So middle of the field close coverage versus cover two, specifically cover two man. He just wasn't very good against those cover two situations where he had the middle of the field open. So that's the thing I'm going to probably probably be trying to zero in on when I'm looking at it is he's going to get some looks where he's got some two deep safeties, maybe even cover four. What does he look, you know, how is he able to take advantage of those sorts of things when they have, basically it's a harder read and a harder throw where you got to go over the linebacker under the safety is Mertz able to do that. Is he able to take advantage of it? And does he start pushing the ball down the field in those sorts of situations? So um, that's what I'll be looking for is I'll be looking for them going downfield with Graham Mertz more often. I think last year there were a lot of check downs and I think part of that was him being relatively new to the offense. Part of that was him trying to cut back on some of those mistakes that he made at Wisconsin, but it's time to open it up. And so I'm interested to see whether he's able to open it up in the spring game as sort of a harbinger for what might be coming in the fall. It, it, Will, it was also, you know, we do talk coach speak a little bit here, but it was also at the same time refreshing to hear Napier bring that up because we have talked about it. You know, it has been a point of emphasis. They get the ball down the field a little bit more. And I mean, credit to Napier there. You know, they didn't, he didn't hide behind it or shy behind it. It was like, look, we got to get this calculated risk up, you know, if we want to get this offense to take a step. That is one of the the, the aspects of this offense has got to take that step. Yeah, well, S SEC StatCat does a really nice job of charting all the plays in the SEC. And uh, I went in and looked, and Graham Mertz has the high, had the highest number of checkdowns last year in all of the SEC. Not a surprise, given his average depth of target. But when we talk about a completion percentage being at 71 72%, it's a little bit of a faux number when you've got 50 completions that are checkdowns. And so that that number needs to come down. The interesting thing is when you look at how he performed on double posts or four verticals or different different downfield concepts, he was actually really good on those concepts, delivered at much higher rates than some of his contemporaries, except for Jaden Daniels, because Jaden Daniels blew everybody on the water on those things. But he was delivering at like a 60% clip on four verticals downfield, explosive plays. The problem is he threw like six of them all year long. And it's not because they only called six, four verticals. Right. It's because it's because there were a lot of check downs to the running back when four verts was called. And the reality is you're calling that play. Now, look, if, if the team plays cover four against four verts, you want to check down. So it's not like a check down is like the worst thing in the world. But if you get, if you get a cover three, look against four verts, you've got a, you've got an open guy going down the field and that is a shot you have to take. And that'll be the question is when they make that call, and it's against a defense where you've got an advantage. Is Mertz going to take that shot or not? I think we'll see that in the spring game. We saw it a couple of years ago when Jack Miller and Anthony Richardson were playing, and there were opportunities for each of them to look off a safety and then go the other direction. And I didn't think Miller did a very good job of it. I thought Anthony Richardson did a much better job of it. And I think we've seen that develop over time in terms of those guys. Now, it's not like Miller got an awful lot of run here at Florida. But part of the reason he didn't get a lot of run at Florida is because they thought Graham Mertz was a better option. And so those are the sorts of things that I'll be looking for is what is he doing against particular defensive packages? Because my guess is he's not going to be playing against the ones on defense 
or if he is, it'll be sort of a mishmash of ones. It's not probably going to be ones on ones. And if that's the case, then there'll be guys who get physically beat from time to time. The question is, did you do what you were supposed to do with the coverage and take the shot you were supposed to take, even if you threw it up and maybe it's got a chance of being intercepted. That's even like if he throws it downfield and it has a shot to be picked or gets picked, that's not a bad thing in the spring game. Cause it means he's still sort of calibrating, but at least he's starting to take those shots. Uh, for me. Yeah. To me, it's the transfers man, and the impact they make at offensive line with Brendan Crenshaw, Dixon, Devin Manuel, linebacker, Pup Howard, and then safeties, DJ Douglas, Asa Turner, Triquez Bridges, uh, that's what I'm looking for this spring is, you know, when we get through the five weeks of spring practice, get to that spring game, you know, how much of the impact, because we're, we're hearing good things so far on those transfers. Um, and it doesn't have to, we'll kind of get into a little bit of a question here in just a second too. Does it necessarily have to translate to the spring game? No, but I would like to continue to hear throughout spring practice, those transfers uh, <laughs> uh, kind of uh, start standing out or, and keep standing out, I guess. Uh, so this is an interesting question here. Which spring standout will be able to carry over into the fall? And kind of talked about that the last episode uh, coming off the first scrimmage. But, of course, DJ Douglas, uh, Pup Howard was mentioned, Chimre DK at wide receiver, and the freshman running backs, Ball and Daniels. Uh, that's probably the group of players I've heard the most about uh, so far uh, in, in spring practice. And I'm going to go defense here. Well, maybe my bias shows, but I'm going to go Pup Howard uh, for the standout so far that I hope, you know, it kind of just transfers over into the season uh, because, I mean, he's going to he's gonna keep piling up the reps in, in spring practice with, you know, some of the injuries Florida's had at linebacker. And then he gets to play beside Samar James in, in the fall. So a high-profile linebacker recruit, has a year under him, transfers in from South Carolina, I think he'll be an immediate impact this fall at the linebacker spot. Florida needs him to be. I think he will be. Douglas is probably even with him here. And honestly, you know, I spoke about both these guys the last episode. Douglas has been the player I've heard about the most uh, so far through spring practice. They're at the safety spot. Jordan Castell a little limited. Uh, him making the most of his reps right there beside Asa Turner. But for, you know, for me, I think probably got to go transfer here as well. Uh, for the standout that would kind of translate into the season. That warms my heart so much because DJ <laughs> Douglas is the guy that I want, 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 want to be the one who's real. Jordan Castell played pretty well last year. There were some missed tackles that caused big plays. We didn't get a lot of help. Uh, Miguel Mitchell for the year was the 810th ranked ranked safety in all of FBS, according to Pro Football Focus. You had Jason Marshall, 455, Jaden Hill, 619, Jalen Kimber, 433. So Castell at 175 was actually the best player in secondary last year, and no one else around him was really helping him out at all. Now, you got Devin Moore, who maybe is the guy that I look at and say, if they could just keep him healthy, like that would be a guy who'd really help things. But Douglas has a track record of being very, very good. And now we're hearing that he's playing well, uh, playing well in the spring. And I think those two things, you know, again, we talked about spring lies, all that sort of stuff. It's fun to make those comments. But I think the reality is, is when you've got a guy with a track record and now everybody's saying, look at what this guy's doing. If nothing else, you know, you're at least going to get the floor or that the floor of the guy is going to be way better than what Florida had last year. So I, I look at it and I say, do who do I think is going to probably transfer over? I think it's Douglas or Asa Turner in terms of like who's going to be a major contributor for the defense. But the guy that I hope, oh man, if Douglas can be like an elite safety, not just an average safety, not just sort of, hey, it's a little bit better than than what we've, or I mean, it'd be significantly better than what Florida's had. But if he can be a guy who like is a major contributor, all of a sudden Florida's defense takes a major step up. I'm glad you said that one part you said about the the floor being high. Like, I'm still not sure about the ceiling of this Gator team overall. I do think the floor is higher in a lot of areas. Now, that does not have to necessarily mean more wins. Uh, they, you know, we've talked about the schedule. We'll get in that just a second, too. Um, but I do think the floor is higher uh, for, for this team because of the transfers they've brought in, the competition that those transfers are going to breed. I think that's going to help Florida. Uh, but in the end, I still don't know – the ceiling uh, of the team. There's a, there's a long way to get to that point. Uh, but I do think the bottom part of this team can be better. 
Um, so let's go to the next question here. Who is going to be this year's summer enrollee stud like Eugene Wilson was last season? Well, there's not many options here. So <laughs> uh, I don't know we get that type of impact. Uh, he was pegged to almost be what we got last year at that receiver spot, and he showed up to, to, to be that. There's only three coming in, Will, this summer, and that's tight end Amir Jackson, linebacker Aaron Childs, and offensive lineman Marcus Mascall. So probably be between Childs and Jackson, and I'll probably go with Jackson at the tight end spot, but it, it's tough. Uh, I think the depth chart helps him probably get on the field sooner and maybe even more. Linebacker, you got Shamar James, Pup, Nunnery, Robinson, Wingo, Graham, Childs there. He's got, he got to pass a lot of guys to get a lot of reps to make a huge difference. Um, now, he's probably more talented, but I just think – you know, Jackson has the potential to see more staffs just because of the position he plays. I'm not sure there's actually an answer here, but if I had to pick one, it'd be Amir Jackson. Look, that's not a shot at those guys. I mean, Trey Wilson was special last year. It's hard to me. It's hard for me to see anybody have that type of impact. Yeah, I'm taking none of the above on this one, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I mean, I, I think that's a legitimate thing. It's yeah. it's tough to play tight end in the SEC, and if Amir Jackson's getting major snaps at tight end, especially early in the year, boy, has something gone wrong. Either that or something's gone really, really right, and it turns out they looked at it and go, oh my goodness, like it's the second coming of Kyle Pitts. We have to get him out on the field, but the point is, is that if he's just as good as Arliss Boardingham and Hayden Hansen, those guys are going to play. Right, he's gonna have to be clearly better than those guys to get out on the field significantly. And remember, we got Zipper coming back as well. Yeah. Um, so it's not as though there's nobody at that position. You listed all the guys at linebacker, and if you think about Trey Wilson last year, who was he beating out at wide receiver? Right. I mean, you have you have Khalil Jackson. I mean, Spirto was getting got a, got a scholarship by the time the season was over. He had to obviously beat out Aiden, Andy Jean and Aiden Mizell, but Marcus Burke was somebody he had to beat out. Frazier is somebody he had to beat out. Like Those aren't guys that we look at and go, I'm going to bounce my grandkid on my knee and tell him about the Jaquavian Frazier's era at Florida, at least not yet. Hopefully that changes, but right now we're not talking about that. And so there wasn't this like giant thing to overcome. The other thing is if you think about how Florida sort of developed the Trey Wilson package. It started as a relatively small thing that then grew over time. And by the time they got to the ninth, 10th, 11th game of the year, he was a big part of the offense, particularly that Georgia game. Oh, early boy, we've on, had, we've it, had that conversation on Gators Breakdown Plus lately. <laughs> but I mean, early on, it was it was the little pot pass, right? Yeah. And that was it. And, and you get three or four of them a game, but that was it. And they were relying on Pearsall on the outside for, for the throws they were actually making downfield. So I look at it and I go, okay, what does Amir Jackson bring to the table that these other tight ends don't? What does Aaron Childs bring to the table that these other linebackers don't? Um, what does Marcus Maskell bring to the table that these other offensive linemen don't? And unless those guys ha differentiate themselves as truly special, like Wilson did, I think it's tough to imagine they're going to be spend too much time out on the field, at least now, just because – you, if they're just as good, you want to get them seasoned and you want them ready for 2025 when they can really make a difference and when some of those guys are are, are leaving the program. Yeah, with well, Wilson, you know, it was it was from a gadget player slash athlete growing into a wide receiver. You know, as you said, especially starting around the Georgia game, the emphasis of him at the beginning of that game and as as you know the South Carolina game making plays right before that as well. Uh, but yeah, you saw him grow as a player, grow as a receiver uh, as the season went on. So um, this one will be quick because um, last one from Justin, Justin Wood here. Is there anything that happens in the spring game that would change your mind on the outlook of the season? Plainly, no. <laughs> There's not. Uh, that's not to say we should overlook it, gloss over it, but it, it, we just don't know what would translate. I mean, I've seen Luke Del Rio go have a perfect spring game. That didn't mean a hill of beans. Uh, so um, it's just, yeah, yeah. There's so just, the, the only thing I would yeah. say is injuries. Yeah. I true. think I think it's possible you could have like a catastrophic injury where you go, oh, no. Yeah. And, it's not, and it wouldn't change my, I mean, you know, we're sitting here in April. We're being optimists. And, right. uh, you know, all of a sudden you sort of have a pull come over the come over the team because somebody important pops an ACL and you go, oh no like here we go again so to me the spring game is let's get out of it healthy 
Right. Let's make sure, you know, show a couple of things, make everybody feel good about the program, all that sort of stuff. Don't have the old timers coming off the sidelines like a bunch of rubes, but, you know, <laughs> show show something, but don't show everything. Get out of that thing healthy and uh, and, and move to fall camp. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, young guys play. I mean, that's not really going to change my outlook any, you know, but, I, yeah, I don't mind seeing those freshman running backs getting plenty of carries to protect Montreal Johnson and Trayon Webb. And, look, I think those guys are going to contribute anyway, uh, but it's not going to change my outlook if Jaden Ball and Kanan Daniels go out there and run for 150 yards apiece. It's just not, look, man, Felipe know. Franks threw for, like, 500 yards <laughs> and six touchdowns or something back in 2018. Yeah. I, I, it, it's 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 silly season, even the spring game. So you I mean, try what, your what best. What did we say after last year's spring game? Oh, we got a defense. Yeah, let's go. Okay, well, I mean, we saw how that turned out. <laughs> well, we have a de- we had a defense. Just you know. Well, okay. It was exactly <laughs> like it had been the previous three years. <laughs> but the spring game last year didn't show that. Will we thought yeah. we thought we had turned a corner. Uh, well, we, we didn't, but we just said wait and see mode. But yeah, that, that's we. I mean, year ago shows us perfectly of. Not really take too much from it. Uh, last one. Chase Wester did send. What game are you most looking forward to this season? Feels like there could be a ton of intriguing matchups, a lot of which are at home. Go Gators. Uh, so, Will, by default, this is always Georgia for me. Um, but, of course, if everything was right, it still would be. Uh, but to play this question, honestly, it's the opener versus Miami. I mean, it, both coaches, year three, So many recruiting battles recently. Both teams desperate to start off on a positive note. I mean, I mean, desperate to start off with a win in 2024. You got a good quarterback battle between Mertz and Ward on on the horizon. The noise will be deafening for the loser of this game. Florida's chance to rebound is much harder than Miami's if you get in in the SEC in that schedule. Uh, We know this program's issue with momentum since Napier's been hired and it will be tough to build some if you don't get a win here if you don't get a win to kick off the season it's at home the lead up will be volatile of course uh, it's a good test for both teams it's the miami game for me <laughs> so i had a tough time with this one and i'm actually going to go with october 12th at tennessee because i look at it and i go we know florida has to have a strong run to open the year because of what's coming on the back end and that means a win over Miami to start with. It means a win over Samford, AM, Mississippi State, UCF. Um, and if they're five and zero coming to that game at Tennessee, the amount of pressure on Heupel to get over that Florida hump when um, you know, like he's been sort of cast as look where Florida would have been if they hadn't, you know. Years ago when Heupel was brought in there, it was like, oh, it's a gimmick offense, all that sort of stuff. And he's been slowly building that program. The question is, are they going to sort of max out where Butch Jones maxed out, or are they going to actually take a next step forward? And Tennessee has a game against Oklahoma right around that time that's going to sort of tell a lot of things there too. And Florida, if Florida's going to have a special season, they're going to have to win in Knoxville. So that's probably the one that I would point to. And I get what you're saying about Miami, and I agree with you. But if Florida does win that game against Miami, I look at the next one on the schedule where I go, it could really turn this season from something where people are like, eh, okay, I'm kind of excited about the year to holy crap, like this team has an opportunity to be really, really good. And if they're sitting there going, you know, six and one into that Georgia game, into that stretch of five, there's an opportunity there for Florida to have a really good year. And I said this when the 2025 schedule came out. The 2024 and the 2025 schedules only stink because we're not certain that Florida is going to be any good. If Florida was good, we'd be salivating because we'd be sitting there going nine and three gets us into the playoffs. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it would be true, right? So like the game against Old Miss where Mississippi might be, might be imploding by then. We've all seen DJ Ue Agalele play quarterback. I'm not really worried he's going to be Jordan Travis. LSU has to replace Jaden Daniels. The Texas and Georgia games are pretty tough. There's no doubt there, right? But there is an opportunity opportunity if Florida can pull things through to if things fall right to where they're going to be able to to maybe even sneak in or certainly certainly be able to put up a season that everybody's proud of and says that's real progress but I don't think you get that season without beating Tennessee and that game's on the road in Knoxville in October and Tennessee's certainly going to be motivated given what a house of horrors any sort of Florida game has been for them over the past what 30 years now so that's the one I'd sort of circle and part of that is just me being 
when I went to school there in 99 to 04, like Tennessee, knocking Florida out in 20 in 2001 at the end of the year. And God, I hate the volunteers. And it's been awesome just dominating them for years and years and years. So I'm always going to circle that one. And it's funny because, you know, it's almost always the third week of the season, obviously with the divisions and it's sort of a bellwether for where the season's going to go. I think that's kind of true this year too. I think if Florida loses the game against Tennessee, the season's going to be a disaster. If Florida wins that game against Tennessee, it can be a really, really significant success. So that's what I would say, Tennessee. There we go. Miami and Tennessee right there for uh, games. I mean, like I said, I, I can say Georgia all the time, but that's just it's bias. It's for, you know, most personal game for me. So I just think if I took a, 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 a zoom out and looked at it, they got to start that. It's got got to start the season off on, on, on a high note, and I like the way I, you went with it too. I gotta be honest, dude. Like the 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 disappointing thing about the playoff this year is that if Florida were able to rise up and beat Georgia, Georgia would probably still make it in the playoff. Yeah. And I'm like, like there was so much like that game last year didn't mean a whole lot to Florida by the time you got to that point. Yeah. Other than the win would spoil Georgia's season. And that was going to be awesome. Um, those sorts of things are going to be lost and that's right. a little bit sad, but also there's Thanks opportunity, there's opportunity on the back end. And so hopefully Florida can start to, to mine that opportunity on the back end by the time, uh, by the time 2024 is over, certainly by the time 2025 is over. For sure. For sure. All right, good stuff. Uh, well, you had a recent recruiting article up at Reed Reaction. Yeah, I went and looked back at 2020. Um, so it sort of was my interest got peaked because DeMarcus Bowman washed out at Central Florida, and there were some folks who were out there talking about how well this this is just proof that stars don't matter. And uh, so, of course, the nerd in me wanted to look back at his class in 2020 and say, "Hey, how did people turn out?" And it's exactly how you would expect. But I think there's some interesting thing and in, things in there about volume and how many recruits that Georgia's had who fit that profile versus Florida, and how often the guys have turned out. I mean, we remember the C.C. Jeffersons, the Martez Ivies of the world, um, and the Antonius Clayton, sort of the top 30 guys who didn't work out. But I think it also does point to the fact that keeping DJ Lagway and keeping LJ McRae in this 2024 class is a significant thing for Billy Napier because if both, you know, 60% of those guys tend to end up in, in the NFL – and if both of those guys end up NFL quality players, then uh, then Florida's going to be rocking and rolling pretty soon with those guys at the at the helm of it. Good deal, good deal. Everybody, readreaction.com to go read Will's latest there on recruiting and uh, that that look back and look ahead uh, right there. Uh, so, anything else, Will? You got coming up. Oh, we're just working hard on our preseason magazine. We should have some announcements pretty soon about pre-orders, those sorts of things. Um, usually the website slows down this time because we're trying to gather all the info for that magazine. But it's cool. It's it's 70 pages, Florida Gator only. So you think about like the Lindy's and the and the Athlon magazines that we go over every every uh, every summer. And this is sort of adding to that, but it's but it's specific to Florida. Um, usually some film breakdowns and some recruiting maps and all sorts of stuff. Things you've come to know and love about Read and Reaction and uh, and that shows up there. So that's really what we're working on right now. Um, trying to put some stuff up on the website when we get an opportunity, but uh, but that's the big thrust right now. There's like five pages of hating the expanded playoff and realignment, all that stuff too, right? Uh, we haven't really gotten to that <laughs> point yet. Actually, so you know, I, I can sort of tell people the concept. The concept is we've we've taken all the things that people have said about Florida this offseason, and we're actually going to try to take an honest look at all of them, right? statistically okay doesn't is this true right like when someone says that florida doesn't go downfield yeah it's definitely true but what does that mean right and what can we see that's different and what do we see something that says that florida should be able to succeed in a way they didn't last year those sorts of things so those are those are the kinds of things we're gonna be looking into um so hopefully everybody you know when, when you go to the water cooler and somebody from uh from miami tells you before the season starts oh well your team can't do this you're like yeah but did you know that this is something that, you know, success rate for the defense is something that transfers. And for Florida last year, it was a major outlier. That'll be at least one of the stories that's in there that, that we're looking at. So you'll have some ammo when you go to the water cooler and one of your Miami buddies comes up to, tell, to talk crap about Florida. <laughs> we had a Miami buddy in the chat. Kane Thing 24 came in here and hey, some – some some good some good talk some good cordial talk right there. Hey, he's so. hating Florida State, so I mean, yeah. like I I don't I don't hate Kane thing right now. He'll probably <laughs> say something in a couple of seconds that make makes me wish that he wasn't in the chat. But, but as of right now, welcome. We welcome the Canes fans until the week after the game, unless we win. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff right there. 
Uh, all right, that'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. There is Will Miles, readreaction.com, YouTube, Read Reaction. Him and Nick Newton do a great job there. I am David Waters, host of Gators Breakdown. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining us on this episode of Gators Breakdown.